Welcome to Middle School Science, Module 7. Today we're covering heredity and biological evolution for praxis preparation. This is a partnership with TLC Tutoring Co. and Arkansas State University. Let's begin with heredity. Heredity refers to the passing of genetic factors from parents to offspring or from one generation to the next. These genetic factors are directed by nucleic acids within living cells, and the two main types are called DNA and RNA. Both DNA and RNA are made from nucleotides, and each contains a 5-carbon sugar backbone, a phosphate group, and a nitrogen base. DNA provides the code for the cell's activities, while RNA converts that code into proteins to carry out those cellular functions. So, as you can see here, DNA and RNA work together within the cells. So, RNA is just ribonucleic acid, and DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. As you can see, DNA has a double helix design, while RNA is a single chain that allows for the protein formation and the processes to function. Now, notice that C and G, cytosine and guanine, and AT, adenine and thymine, are always paired together. That is called the base pair and the coding of the DNA. RNA is different in that instead of thymine, it has uracil, but it uses the same basic coding pattern to make copies of itself and to make proteins. Now, DNA replication refers to the process of copying and duplicating a DNA molecule. This allows copies of DNA to be made for cellular division in mitosis or meiosis. So the double helix will open as the two strands separate, allowing nucleotides to connect to the correct bonding points and resulting in two identical copies of the DNA double helix strand. Transcription is the process of making a copy of the genetic information in DNA into a complementary strand of RNA, so it'll have the opposite coding on it, and it uses that RNA strand called messenger RNA. The DNA strand will unwind where it's necessary to allow the mRNA to connect, make its copy, and then move on to where it's needed. Following that would be translation. That's a step where the genetic code from a strand of M messenger RNA is decoded to produce a particular sequence of amino acids. This follows transcription of the DNA strand to the mRNA strand. Inside the ribosomes of the cell, the mRNA strand is coded and connected with the appropriate amino acids in the correct sequence, and when the protein is assembled, it will be folded into the correct structure. Let's talk about hereditary mechanics. How exactly does this work? So we'll start with chromosomes. This is a structure within the cell that bears the genetic material as a thread-like linear strand of DNA bonded to various proteins. Now a gene is the fundamental physical and functional unit of hereditary. Gene rep genes represent a very small section of the DNA strand that controls a specific function or trait, say for red hair or left-handedness. Now alleles is a specific copy of a gene. Usually alleles are found in two pairs, where each copy of the alleles is inherited from one parent. So you get one uh, allele from your father and one from your mother, and these alleles may be dominant or recessive. When you have two alleles, the dominant allele, this is the allele that will be expressed, mass the effect of the recessive allele, the allele, the allele that is not expressed. Because if you have two alleles, only one generally will be expressed. So whether you have red hair and brown hair, the one that you have will end up being the dominant allele. Now, within that is also proteins. Proteins are biomolecules composed of amino acid residues joined together by peptide bonds, and much of the actual mechanics of the cell is carried out with proteins. Now, there are two broad types of reproduction. You have sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction. So we'll spend a moment with both. So sexual reproduction involves two parents and the joining of the male and female gametes. That's their portions, their alleles connecting together during what we call fertilization. The offspring in will inherit a mixture of genes from both parents. So they are different to each other and to their parents. So there's some benefits and disadvantages. Now, this produces a lot of genetic variation in the offspring. Every offspring will be different. 
Now, the species can adapt to new environments due to variation, which gives them a survival advantage if they need to adapt quickly. And a disease is less likely to affect all the individuals in a population. But there are some disadvantages. Time and energy are needed to find a mate. Uh, sexual reproduction takes more time, takes more energy that could be used on other things. And it's not possible for an isolated individual to reproduce. If you have one parakeet, you can't get uh, any more parakeets unless you can find them a mate. Now, asexual reprodu reproduction is where there is only one parent, and the offspring functionally are clones of the parent and to each other. So there's benefits here. The population can increase rapidly when the conditions are favorable, and you only need one parent. It is more time and energy efficient as you don't need a mate. All you need is a single individual to reproduce, and it is much faster than sexual reproduction. Now, the disadvantages are it does not lead to genetic variation within a population. The chances of getting mutations are rather small. And the species may only be suited for one habitat. You're, going, you're not going to get a lot of variation leading to more flexibility. And because all the individuals are clones, a disease could affect all the population, all the individuals in that population, all at the same time. Now, as we talk about the variation of traits, whatever kind of reproduction we're using, this is how we might talk about it. So we have what we call Mendelian inheritance. So this type of biological inheritance, it conforms to a set of principles set up by Gregor Mendel regarding the transmission of genetic characters from parents to their offspring. So he was a, a monk who studied thousands of pea plants, tracking their traits and changes in their offspring. A Punnett square is a tool to show all possible allelic combinations in order to predict the probability of their offspring having certain sets of alleles. A Punnett square is made with grids and letters. In particular, capital letters represent dominant alleles and lowercase letters to recessive alleles. And with this tool, the known genotypes of each parent are shown to help predict the possible genotypes of their offspring. It shows how alleles are inherited or passed on to offsprings from their parents. And on the next slide, we're gonna look at one so we can interpret it. So here is a Punnett square for uh, a yellow pea plant and a green pea plant. So we can see that the capital letter Y is the yellow. That is the dominant allele is for yellow coloring and the recessive allele is for green. Now, one of the parents is yellow because they, have a, they are yellow colored and they have the dominant allele. The green plant has no dominant allele. It has two recessive alleles, therefore it is green. So you fill in the square by multiplying or pairing the combinations that you see. So we can see statistically two of the offspring should have yellow coloring due to that being the dominant allele. But also two of the offspring should be green since there is no dominant allele present. So this means statistically if we had four offspring, we'd end up with two yellow and two green. Now a mutation is a permanent heritable, so it can be passed on, change in the nucleotide sequence or the process by which such change occurs in a gene or a chromosome. Now, these can be small scale or large scale, and small scale mutations might affect just one or a few nucleotides of a gene. Typically, these are substitution where a gene, you know, a specific gene or a nucleotide has been swapped, insertion where you have an extra nucleotide, or deletion where something's been removed. These mutations could be neutral, with you don't notice or doesn't affect really that much, beneficial, where it leads to extra advantages, or harmful, depending on the specifics of that small mutation. Now, large-scale mutations will affect the chromosome itself, much larger changes, with large sections being duplicated, deleted, or inverted. Mutations can arise naturally, or they can be caused by exposure to radiation, mutagens, that's material that causes mutations, or certain chemicals. If the mutation cannot be repaired or overwritten with the replicative process of the DNA, it will propagate the error quickly and spread throughout the organism. So let's talk about biological evolution. So we've talked about mutation and genetic passing. Biological evolution is the change in inherited traits over successive generations 
or in populations of organisms. These modifications can occur due to gene mutation or genetic combination, as we've seen. We could breed something on purpose, or it could just be gene mutations. They can be removed by natural selection or just drift. And Charles Darwin is considered the father of evolutionary theory. So there's multiple types of evidence supporting evolution, including ancient organism remains, fossil layers, similarities among living organisms, and similarities of embryos. And we'll dig into each of these. First of all, ancient organism remains indicate that there are large numbers of species that existed in the past but have since gone extinct. Many of these creatures are very different than those alive today, indicating that life is not unchanging, but that similarities existed between current life and these fossilized specimens. Additionally, fossil layers are, show that fossils are formed in sedimentary rock, because rock, sedimentary rock is formed in layers by depositing and pressing sediments on top of each other. These layers can indicate major extinction level events where large numbers of creatures disappeared and others developed and thrived. And then new organisms constantly appear in the fossil record. And as you see, as you go further down, you are getting to older levels that four is older than three and five is older than four. Next, there are similarities among living organisms. This supports evolution in that organisms are similar to each other, but not exactly the same. Similar organisms have differences that help adapt them to their surroundings. So for instance, consider horses, donkeys, and zebras. They're all very similar in the way that their legs are constructed and their general body shape, but their coloring and details are very different because zebras are living on the savanna. The stripes become helpful there. You know, horses and donkeys are quite different as well as moss, butterflies, bees, and grasshoppers. All of the insects have a lot of similarities. They have, you know, a head, an abdomen, and a thorax. But they also have differences depending on exactly where they're living in their surroundings, what kind of biome they're in. Most animals have traits and features in common, but each is adapted to their specific environment. Now, DNA has given us the ability to quantitatively compare organisms and to discover even more connections between types of organisms. Another difference and thing to consider is similarities among embryos, and that suggests common industry. Embryos are, you know, the early embryo and embryonic phase of growing a living animal. So if you look at these mammals, birds, reptiles, fish, etc., they look very similar, and it's, frankly, it's difficult to tell them apart. If you look at this example here, we have a fish, a salamander, a tortoise, a chicken, and a human. And if you look at the early embryos, they look very similar. In the mid-stage, some of them start to look different and others still look the same. And then, as you get to the mature embryo or the fetus, you can start to see some of the differences. But they still have a lot of things in common. This, since these animals are similar and they develop similarly, this implies they are related and have common ancestors and that they started out the same, gradually evolving different traits, but that the basic plan for the creature's beginning remains the same. Now, when we have so many organisms, it becomes a way that we need to classify them. So that process is called taxonomy. That's the study of naming, defining, and classifying groups of biological organisms based on their shared characteristics. There are seven major, generally accepted, levels of taxonomy, beginning with kingdom, the broadest, at the top of the diagram, running down to species. So kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Using this framework, we can classify any organism with other organisms of whom they share characteristics. The taxonomy of a human is displayed on the right. So you can see humans would be the animal kingdom, the chordate phylum, the mammal class, the primate order, the hominid family, homo genius, and then homo sapiens is our species. Now let's talk about adaptation and natural selection, which is part of the evolutionary process. So an adaptation is the process where an organism becomes better able to live in its habitat or habitats. Now natural selection is the process where organisms better adapted, the ones that have adapted, tend to survive and produce more offspring. And the ones that are less adapted produce less offspring and they tend not to survive. 
They work together to allow organisms to adapt to their environment. Extinction occurs when a species is not able to adapt to changes in their environment and they die out, which leads to them being replaced by other organisms that have adapted. Mutations are the primary vehicle for traits that can later be selected and grow dominant. These traits can and do change over time in response to their environment. And this completes Middle School Science Module 7. You're done with hereditary and biological evolution. Module 8 will cover Earth and space science. Thank you very much.